Welcome to the American Security Council Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. The mission of the American Security Council is to educate and engage American citizens on national security matters, economic security matters, and the need for moral leadership in the United States of America. Please enjoy the podcast. Welcome to Protecting Our Freedoms podcast. I'm your host, Joy Vacherbeck, here with my co-host, Mark Renahan. How are you doing, Joy? Good, Mark. And today we have the second in our four-part series on Cuba from the 1950s to the present. Today's guest is Dr. Ray Leon. I'm sorry. Ledon. Ledon. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, doctor. He That's will, good, Joy. <laughs> he will be talking about his life in Cuba and his father's role in Castro's revolution. Yeah, so everyone who's watching, you can follow us here on Facebook. Uh, we're also on YouTube, Rumble, all the social media channels. As Joy stated, today we have with us author Ray F. Ladon. Uh, he is the son of, I believe he's going to tell us all this himself, but Fidel Castro's health minister at one point. He has a yes. different view yes. of the thank, events th in Cuba. Thank you both for having me. Uh, yeah, it's great to have you, thank Doc. You, Doctor. Uh, Doc, we usually just Maybe. jump right in. And we let you kind of tell your story. So I have your book here. For those who are watching, it's A Cold July in Cuba. It is an amazing book. You can get it on Amazon. But, Doc, maybe we'll just let you talk about uh, your life. I, I, I love to. Um, I think it's an interesting story that should be told. Uh, just curious because I'm not the, used to Zoom meetings too much. <laughs> um, I'm seeing... Uh, I don't see you. That's okay, correct? Yes, that is yes. okay. That's the, yes. They, they okay. see us on the show and you as it comes back and forth on the, the producers camera. will see it. Very good. Very good. Um, well, again, I'm, uh, I'm a, an American citizen who's lived all over the world. Uh, my childhood, I, I would say, was a little bit more than, uh, than your normal average, uh, you know, middle class child uh, childhood. Um, it was uh, it was a different time in Cuba. Uh, it was an important time in Cuba, and uh, my father's story I think is really worth telling. Um, as, as, in, in form of a synopsis, um, you know, he was born in 1920 uh, to a lower middle class uh, family in the province of Matanzas, which is the next province east of Havana, uh, in a little town called, called Cardenas, which is it's famous for two things. One thing was the architecture. Uh, as I stated in my book, it was the first time that engineers actually said, you know, if we're going to build a town, let's do something different. All Spanish towns in all colonial uh, possessions were always uh, modeled after a Spanish little town where you have a central plaza and everything radiates from there. Um, the people from Cardenas had, had visited Charleston uh, South Carolina and said, you know, this is the way a city should be like a grid. It makes, you know, transportation, it makes getting around better. So they actually brought the engineers uh, who, who designed the city of Charleston to Cardenas. And that's who designed the city. So in that sense, it was the first non-Spanish colonial city in Cuba. And it was also famous for a very, very bad hurricane and I'm really not sure of the year. It was in the 1800s. But uh, there are stories well recorded of people look, looking at shark fins on, on city streets because the city was completely taken out by a hurricane. Mm. But nevertheless, my father was, was born into that uh, type of an atmosphere. It was a country town, capital of the province, but not a, not a large town. And because of lack of opportunity, my grandfather um, moved the family to Havana. They moved to a neighborhood called Marianao, which is a working class neighborhood, not one of the f fancy neighborhoods of Havana, where he eventually took his money and opened a small movie theater where all the three boys, there were three boys. My father had a twin, but he died at birth. Um, mm. Sort of ran the, the theater with my grandfather. Um, my father had a lot of dreams. His biggest dream was to become a pilot. Uh, he wanted so bad to fly. And he knew he had a, an uncle who was a general in the Cuban Air Force. So he, he joined the Air Force. Uh, my grandfather didn't know this. And we've, when he found out, he was not happy. 
he actually went to see his cousin, whoever the general was, and said, you know, Ramon is not flying any planes for any army in any country. He's going to be a doctor. That's what his father wants him to be. And basically, he was let, let go the next day. He was on his own and on to medical school. Oh, poor guy. <laughs> I, so, I, I understand because I, I, I actually do fly. I have my private license. But Joy yeah. is a pilot and just got <laughs> very excited when she heard I that. Did. Go ahead, I Doc. <laughs> let, let, let me tell you, dude, during his later years in Canada, uh, my father had a very very good friend who I still keep in touch with, who's another physician in Canada, by the name of John LaFrance, who's a pilot. And he, he would relish when John would take me and my father up in his four-seater Cessna and mm. all around the uh, St. Lawrence and up in Ontario and, and Quebec. So he always loved planes and flying. So fast forward, he goes into medical school. Those were... You know, years of turmoil in Cuba, a lot of political stuff was going on at that time. You have to realize that Cuba was a country who was fiercely independent. From the 1800s, even in the 1700s, Cubans began to rebel against Spanish colonization of Cuba. And in the 1800s, what we called the, the War of Liberation, the Revolutionary War, uh, was fought for many years between the Spaniards and the Cubans, if you like, even though most Cubans were either first generation or have been born in Spain at that time, you know. Um, it got to the point where there was almost um, mass casualties. I mean, there was a point when Spain realized that they couldn't win the war against the Cuban rebels uh, in the countryside. So they, they put in a... Uh, a policy of basically slash and burn. And they move all, all the, the citizens from the little towns and the country into the larger towns and basically burn the fields and try to starve the country out. Mm. It is said that 400,000 Cubans, and this is at that time in a country of two or three million, died of hunger during that time. Mm. But by the end of the 1800s, uh, the, the war was basically over except for the fact that the Spaniards had barricaded themselves in Havana, which was a fortress city, and in Santiago de Cuba, in the eastern end of the island, um, in, uh, which was another fortress city. And, and the rebels, because they had no artillery, no navy, they really had no way to dislodge them from there. Um, and that's where the United States came in. That's when Teddy Roosevelt and the Rough Riders, uh, San Juan Hill, all those stories come from that last year, year and a half, where the Cubans, in desperation, asked the United States for help. Again, it was a war that was over, but they had, they had no way of getting the Spaniards out of there. And the Spaniards had a strong navy. Then the United States, of course, parked the main in Havana Harbor. The story that we're always taught in Cuban uh, grammar school, in Cuban history, is that the main blew up either because of an accident or it was purposely blown out blown up by the Americans in order to have an excuse to declare uh, war on, on the Spaniards. I don't believe that. I think it was just a boiler accident. It just happened that in those years, most sailors wanted to go to Havana and have a night off. So most sailors were off the ship, thank God. Mm -hmm. So the casualties were massive. But it was, it was what ignited the end of the war. And then the Americans came in, took out the, the Spaniards from Santiago and from Havana, and said, this is it, war's over. The sad part is that despite the fact that all the Cuban rebel forces were massed outside of Havana, they weren't even invited to the table to sign the peace agreement mm. between Spain and the United States. And that was a knife in the heart of many Cubans, but at the same time, they needed to get close to that big dog to dislodge the other big dog. So that was accepted. That's when the Platt Amendment was put into the Cuban Constitution. The Platt Amendment basically gave the United States the right to go into Cuba at any time for any reason to, quote unquote, protect democracy and the rights of the Cuban people. But it was really uh, a way of saying, listen, if things here don't go the way we want to, uh, we're going to change it. And it did give land grants to the United States and an American company. So there was always uh, a, a love-hate relationship between Cubans and the United States because, yes, 
they helped us get rid of Spain, but they they didn't let us sit at the table. They didn't let us have a say. And then they put in this amendment that gave him Guantanamo for a hundred years, gave him land, etc. So some Cubans were never too happy about the United States, but slowly over the years, the United States became a benevolent partner. Um, they only meddled when it was absolutely necessary, when, when there was political chaos in Cuba. Um, and they said, you know, we, we don't want the dictatorship, we want a democratic country. Like many South American and Central American countries, Cuba has never been great at democracy. Uh, and there's always been an undercurrent of corruption and, and political favoritism in our country, especially in Cuba at that time. And Vida, uh, Fulgencio Batista was basically an illiterate uh, farm boy who joined the army and uh, was ruthless. And he saw, he, he was... He, he was smart in a political way. He could see what he had to do to get people to back him. And uh, eventually, he first did it with just the sergeants when they thought that the army and the president were uh, were corrupt and they did a coup and took power. And then eventually he realized that he wanted to be a loved, democratically elected uh, person. And he tried to do it that way. Things didn't work out. He eventually had to leave Cuba came back, uh, I think, I believe it was in 52 or 51, and there was the second coup, and he took power. At that time, he, he realized that political uh, oppression and suppression was the only way he was going to stay in power. So he decided to quelch any political uh, dissent that was in Cuba. And Cuba was uh, a country that, especially during the late 40s and early 50s, had an amazing explosion of, of development and building and wealth. So that if you look at uh, United Nations statistics, in 1958 and 57, Cuba had the second highest standard of living in the Americas. It was the United States first, Cuba second, Canada third. So, and, and you know, that's income per capita, literacy rates, all those things. That doesn't mean that it was perfect. It was a totalitarian uh, dictatorship where if you disagreed, you could be killed or disappeared for, for no reason, for any reason. So but because Dr. Cuba you're, was... You're, you're saying the sorry, country yeah. was um, flourishing, though, under this, that even, even under the totalitarian was, government. Correct. It was flourishing even though there were some, some things that were not right. You know, there were still massive landowners uh, who had many people working in their farms for minimum uh, living standards. There was some illiteracy, but not to the point that people make, it believe, uh, make you believe that there was nobody that could read or write in Cuba on the country. Like I said, we had the second standard of living in the Americas at that time. But there was a lot of, uh, a lot of people who, who grew into the middle class in the 50s in Cuba. A lot of people who b became educated, who read, uh, Cuba was always culturally very rich, first because we had our, our proximity to the United States, uh, which a lot of Cubans took advantage of. I mean, the United States was the number one destination for Cubans on vacation to go to university, to get extra medical training, uh, to do all those things. It was always Cuba and the United States. Cuba almost became as, as the 51st state, almost, even though it wasn't. It was fiercely independent and, and so on. But that same uh, middle class uh, became the force behind wanting change. And of course, like in most countries, young people are usually the ones that, that push for change. So the universities became hotbeds of revolution, if you like. You can call it a revolution, but it was really a movement for democracy, for being able to speak your mind and not being... Uh, suppressed or beat up uh, or incarcerated. And then it got very, very bloody. Uh, when, when Batista realized the possibility that um, he could be deposed, he obviously um, did everything he could to prevent that. And then uh, people began to disappear. Uh, students would uh, be left at the steps of the university dead. Uh, mm. 
executed with a big sign. This is what happens to people who disagree with us. Uh, so w- when people tell you that the Cuban revolution uh, was a revolution of like of, of, of the peasants who were hungry, uh, go back to a comment that I've made before, uh, that's not the way it was. It was a revolution of the middle class, of the intelligentsia, of the lawyers, the doctors, even some politicians that realized that that Batista was wrong, and that there was a, a place somewhere in between, you know, communism, and and what he uh, had as a, as a government in Cuba, and uh, the revolution was popular. People who tell you that uh, it was a, a small group of guys with beards in the mountains that took down this this government are, are lying to you. Actually, the revolution took place in the cities. In the cities, people were striking. People were bombing, uh, sabotaging, you know, doing everything they could to bring them down. Uh, Castro, at that time, had fled Cuba. He was uh, let go uh, by Batista after he was caught during an attempted coup um, to a military barracks in 1953, I believe. And he had gone to Mexico, and in Mexico is where he uh, met Che Guevara, who was Argentinian. And uh, they were actually raising funds to be able to go back to Cuba and, and fight. And they put together a group of 82 guys and had some funds from Spaniard who had fled the Spanish Civil War, was on the communist side. And uh, he gave him a, a yacht called Grandma, which is actually the name of the government's newspaper in Cuba. is called Grandma. And um, with that yacht and those 82, they sailed for Cuba. Eventually, they, they were met uh, by Batista's forces. Only 12 made it ashore from the 82, and they hid in the mountains. But it was the revolutionaries in the cities next to the mountains and in Havana who fed him, gave him the arms, gave him the money to survive. And, and the largest revolutionary group was uh, what was called the, uh, the, the translation would be the Revolutionary Bureau, which was in Havana, and it was uh, led by a young a young man by the name of uh, had a nickname of Manzanita, a little apple, because he had a round face. So everybody thought of him as a little apple. And uh, my father belonged to that group. My father was one of the top guys in in that uh, uh, revolutionary bureau. And how old were you when this Castro time? finally? At, at that time, I was, you know, three. Okay. Three years old, four years old. Eventually, Manzanita was killed, um, and my father became even more important in that uh, in that uh, faction of uh, revolutionaries, if you like. And uh, the plan had been in 1958 to call in a national strike to basically bring bring the island to a complete standstill. Uh, and force Batista to leave or to at least address, you know, the the complaints of the people. And and they knew that my father was the one man uh, that I guess could have stopped that strike. And um, one day as he was leaving the hospital, he suddenly realized that his feet were no longer touching the ground. And two guys had him by the elbows and put him in a black car. And off we went. And... Nobody knew where he had gone. Uh, we didn't know. And, you know, because he had started the, the, you know, the professorship of uh, anesthesia at the University of Havana, uh, because he was very well known, uh, our family had good political connections. We knew senators and congressmen in, in the Cuban government. And nobody could say to us where my father was. Mm. Fast forward uh, maybe six weeks. Um, and the head of the um, security forces, the secret police of Havana. And, and if you ever see a movie called The Lost City with Andy Garcia, the, the man in the white suit in that movie is who this man really was, Ventura. His mom breaks a hip. She's 92 years old. My mother's brother, my uncle who idolized my father, had become an anesthesiologist because of my father's interested in anesthesiology and he really worshiped my father so they brought her to 
the hospital where he worked, where my father had disappeared from. And of course, everybody was uh, deadly afraid of having to touch this woman because they knew who the son was and the son could wish you that in a second and he would never think twice about it. So <laughs> they told him, look, she may survive the surgery, but she'll never get over the anesthesia. She's 92. Mm. Well, lo and behold, my uncle gives her anesthesia and she survives. So my uncle leaves the hospital after the surgery or the day after or whatever. He's leaving the hospital and he gets met by another two men who said, please, Dr. Aguilar, please step into the limousine. Uh, Mr. Ventura would like to talk to you. So my uncle, of course, gets in the car and he says, come, come, doctor. I have to, I want to show you something. He takes him to the highest point in Havana and points to the city and says, listen, you see that city out there? Whatever you want in that city is yours because you have saved my mother's life. Wow. And my uncle said, I only want one thing. I want my son, my brother-in-law. And he said, your brother-in-law? Who is your brother-in-law? He said, well, my brother-in-law is Dr. Ladon. And there was silence. And then he looked at him and said, anything but that. My uncle said, that's all I want. And that began a process. He said, look, I can't promise you anything. I'll see what I can do. Later on, we found out that my, when my father disappeared, he was taken to a little house somewhere in a sugar cane plantation in the outskirts, uh, maybe an hour or two away from Havana. Totally incommunicated was a place where they kept, the disappeared, if you like, and they were tortured. And my father was being tortured on a daily basis because they wanted him to go on national TV and call off this general strike that was scheduled. And my father refused. And after my uncle's meeting with Ventura, it was the first time that my father had already been taken out to the firing squad. And he was already been tied to the post, had a, a hood over his head, and was told, last chance. And they call him Dr. Cito, they call him the little doctor. Last time, little doctor, before we kill you, will you call off the strike? And he said, no. And then a car came and said, stop, stop the execution. And that was his first day. That happened two more times. Eventually, I think my uncle wore, uh, plus all the political pressure that was put on him from senators and stuff, wore Ventura down. And Ventura finally came to my uncle and said, look, there are elements in the government that are more powerful than me that want your brother-in-law dead. I cannot tell you that I can let him go uh, and let him go free. That will not happen. But I have managed to be able to move him to a, to a regular jail. He will have a trial and he will be put to death. It's really that simple. What I have tried to do and what I think I've been able to do for you is I've given him a 24-hour furlough to spend with his family before his trial. That was the first time we saw my father in about six months. And um, I... I mean, I was only four or five, but I still today remember the first visit to my father at that jail. And I, and I think what was shocking to me was because I was four, I'd never <clears throat> seen things like this, but there had been a riot in that jail the night before, and 14 prisoners had been shot dead. So when we arrived at El Principe, it's called, it's been a prison since Spanish times. It's a castle sitting high up in one of the hills around Havana and with the dungeon, <laughs> which is where my father was. Oh. But they were hosing the floors and it was blood just coming out. And they walked us through these dungeons. Uh, it was me, my mom, the senator who had been instrumental in, in getting this done for us. Uh, and we finally got to this <coughs> little cell and I really didn't even recognize my father. He was basically a, a bruised skeleton. Mm. Um, there, there were welts all over his body. When he died at 71, he still had those welts on his back. Mm. So, and he was in renal, renal shutdown because of all the muscle uh, tissue that was uh, destroyed by the beatings. Uh, he, he was unrecognizable, really. Um, it was a very, very scary moment for me. Mm. I remember my mother crying, me being... I, who is this? I, I had just, I didn't know. Then um, <clears throat> the day for the furlough came. Um, 
we had made some contacts with some embassies to see if my father could seek asylum. And the only people who had been somewhat responsive were the people of the Costa Rican embassy. Um, so the plan was to try to seek asylum there. Um, when uh, my uncle, my mom, and the senator went to pick up uh, my father at the jail for his 24-hour furlough, a car pulled up behind them, and there was guys with tummy guns sticking out the window. And they all realized that the moment that my father stepped foot out of that car, he was basically a dead man. Mm. So what they did was, instead of taking my father home, is they drove to the Costa Rican embassy and crashed through the gate. Just went right into the gate, <laughs> asked, please, if, if he leaves, they're going to shoot him. Look at them. They're standing outside. So the ambassador was kind enough to put my father up in the garage of the embassy uh, for a few weeks, and slowly they, they became quite friendly. Eventually, my mom um, found, uh, got two tickets on an Iberia uh, Airlines flights uh, from Havana to Madrid, and the ambassador drove my father in his embassy car to the tarmac, to the, to the stairs of the plane, all the while being followed by the car with the, with the tummy guns. So he never stepped back on Cuban soil, and my mother was waiting on the plane. That was at the end of 1958. They went to Spain because that's where our family's from. And, you know, we had my grandfather's house there. They did a little bit of traveling. Then revolution triumphed in 1959. Um, and my father was asked to return, obviously. And he returned to become uh, first uh, the vice minister of health. Then he became the representative of Cuba to the WHO and to the UN. Um, impressive. Very impressive. And, and it was, it, it, and it was funny because where we lived in Havana, next door to me was, or two doors down from me was, the editor of Gramma, the, the the paper of the Communist Party of Cuba, the newspaper. So the editor was a very important man with whom Fidel, Che, and on many occasions my father would meet. On a, almost on a weekly basis, they would come to the editor's house and they would sit down to discuss, I guess, what the news were going to be. Eventually, um, you know, the Bay of Pigs came around. That that day, I will always remember uh, because it's uh, almost like a dream. Um, I, I remember hearing thunder, and it must have been six o'clock in the morning, six thirty, and I see my mom coming into my room, grabbing me and say, come with me. And she takes me to the bedroom, to my parents' bedroom. And I, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. The mattress was off the bed and leaning between the bed and the wall. I could see my sister's head peering out from under the mattress from the floor. And I could see my father almost fully dressed in green fatigues. And then I see him going to the closet and grabbing an M1 rifle. And... As they walked out of the room, and she said, stay there with your sister. They walked out of the room. I kind of snuck out of the room and followed them. And I could hear all this noise. And I just went to a window, opened the blinds, and looked. And between my house and a building that was maybe a block away, there was a high rise. And by high, by, by high rise, I mean um, maybe four or five story building. I could see a plane in flames go by and I see clouds of smoke in the distance and we, we didn't live too far from an air base so what we were witnessing was the bombing of all the air bases by Cuban exiles uh, flying American planes before the invasion of the Bay of Pigs mm. which happened the day after uh, that bombing um, so so that's that that was my uh, my experience of how the revolution came to power. But, but I want to touch on, on, on something that, which I think is very important and very um, apropos of what's going on in, in the United States today. Yes. When Castro came uh, to Havana, uh, I would say the majority of the revolutionary forces were not uh, bearded men in green fatigues that came down from the mountains liberating Cuba. Cuba had basically already been liberated. Castro did not fire a shot on their way down from the mountains to Havana. Um, 
he knew that the power was in the Bureau and, and all the other revolutionary um, organizations that existed for the last four or five years who took down Batista. So he asked everybody to hand in their weapons. And people said, well, we have all the weapons. Why should we hand in our weapons? He said, well, we have one. We are the people. Why would we need weapons against ourselves? We don't. It took a few days before the finally the, the, the other was just, OK, well, that makes sense. Let's do it. And within the revolution, uh, there was a, a strong democratic faction, which was uh, headed by a man of, by the name of Camilo Cienfuegos. And in Cuban revolutionary terms, he's a very, very important figure because he was probably more loved by the people than the Castro brothers, or at least a close second to Fidel Castro. Raul was never liked. Raul, Raul was always an outcast that was very close and had been converted to communism very early by Che Guevara. So the factions in the revolution when it first won were the Che Guevara, Raul Castro communist faction, and the Fidel Castro, who at that time was still not committed either way, and Camilo Cienfuegos faction, which was very democratic. Soon thereafter, um, Camilo Cienfuegos got on a plane to travel from one province to the next, and uh, his plane disappeared. Mm. Everybody in Cuba believes strongly that that was a hit by Che Guevara and Raul Castro to make sure Camilo was never found. Soon thereafter, and because of the Bay of Pigs, they used that excuse to say, see, see, I told you the Americans want you dead. You have to, we have to put ourselves next to a bigger dog to defend us. We have to go to Russia. We have to be friends with the communists. I don't think Fidel really wanted this, uh, but, I, but he didn't see a choice at that time. Uh, because now there was only one one voice in his ear, and that was Raul Castro and Che Guevara. And the other, the, the, the voice of reason, which was Camilo Cienfuegos, the democratic uh, type revolutionary who, was, who had incredible charisma, was no longer there. And that's what, slided, what started the, the great slide of Cuba into communism. Mm. And what made my father, little by little, realize what a lie it was, that this was no different than what it had been in China or in Russia. In other words, we weren't going to do it right this time, like socialists will always tell you, well, it's never been really true socialism. We haven't done it right. No, 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 no. They were doing it exactly the way they knew they were going to do it. Um, and my father initially bought into it. He, he became a member of the Communist Party. That's why my father could never come to the United States. Uh, from Cuba at that time, became the, you know, like I said, the Minister of Health, you know, WHO, et cetera. But he began to see how things were not evolving the way he envisioned them. There was no democracy. They opened the doors to Russian physicians. And uh, I remember, I still remember the stories uh, my father telling when Russian doctors came to Cuba to, quote, unquote, help. Cuban medicine, and my father would come home and said, these people are in the Middle Ages. These surgeons have no idea what they're doing. They're actually asking for steak when people are bleeding because they would put steak against their feet. It was medieval medicine. Mm. So we're teaching them, and eventually Cuban doctors started going to Moscow to teach <laughs> the Russians about Western medicine because our relationship with the United States was so good that our hospitals were almost at par with American hospitals. So, yes, I've heard things that like Cuban, that. Cuban, um, uh, is very, or Cuba is very well known for their doctors. Um. Docs, before I let you keep going, yeah, well, one of the things I wanted to bring up sure. real quick that you're touching on is, so I, I read your book, by the way, it's amazing. And um, <clears throat> growing up, you know, just my, my experiences with Cuba, I think everyone kind of just thinks that, like you said, um, the Cuban Revolution was a bunch of guys with beards coming out of the mountains. And, you know, Batista was a <clears throat> swell guy who the entire populace loved, except for a few people who happened to overthrow him. But <clears throat> in reality, um, from, you know, just from, and obviously I'm going to take your word over any most people I've spoken to on the subject, 
Um, I think the, the, the revolution was very popular at first, uh, which people I don't think are aware of. Like you said, 80% of the country was for it. But at the end, it turned into be that slowly it was the same as before. Is that kind of what you're getting at? Pretty, pretty much. Okay. Uh, in, in other words, we went from a guy who was extremely disliked and had no problems murdering people in Batista to a new regime who had no qualms in killing you again and making you shut up and making you disappear. And initially, the population didn't see this, didn't realize it. Then slowly, it became very insidious at first, but then it became overt. When suddenly somebody knocked on the door and said, you know, my name is Raul Rodriguez and I'm the new head of the neighborhood committee. If there are any problems here, uh, I wanna know about it. If you see any suspicious activities, I wanna know about it. Uh, and these are the same people who suddenly became spies for the government. Mm. Um, every, every neighborhood in Cuba became part of a neighborhood committee where there was somebody assigned who worked for the secret police to basically spy on the people of the neighborhood. And if you spoke out of turn or if you complained about the revolution, you disappeared. It was really that simple. If you were homosexual, you were picked up and put into a concentration camp to be re-educated. Uh, if you were this... You lost your job and little by little they impregnated and took over every section of cuban society it sounds and, similar to what they're doing in china you know, I, I, it, it, exactly so they're done in every other country i remember i used to walk to school every morning and i would walk with che Guevara's kids because it was on our way and it was the same school so i would go by the door they would come on we'd all keep going we'll go to school and you don't realize, and, and, and this becomes very, very important now, especially with CRT and the things that we're hearing about our schools. Mm -hmm. It is very easy to indoctrinate children. Very, very easy. I will tell you that when I left Cuba and I was 12 years old, I had already come home and said to my mom, Mom, are we someday going to go to the United States? And she said, well, that's the plan, son. We're going to go to Spain, and eventually we're going to go to the United States. And she said, uh, and I said, well, I don't want to go to the United States. And she said, why? I said, well, because, you know, the, the U.S. Marines, they're cannibals. They eat Vietnamese children. My teacher told me that, Mom. And she was, no, son, that is not true. American GIs are not cannibals. They don't eat Vietnamese children. No, no, no. That is not true. I mean, they actually had us believing that in class. Mm. It, so it, it's scary when parents don't pay attention to what their children are being taught. And I think it's a very important case in point now in this country. Um, but anyway, little by little, uh, my father became disenchanted with what he was saw was happening. But I think the nail in the coffin what made him realize that uh, this is over, this is, there's nothing that we can do, was the fact that he got a call from the wife of a nephew of his who had gone to medical school. He was a young, young gentleman. And in Cuba, um, <clears throat> they passed the law right after the Bay of Pigs where there was forced conscription. In other words, any male between the ages of 14 and 27 had military service. And during that time, you could not leave the country. The doors were slowly closing, and soon thereafter, nobody could leave the country for any reason unless you had special visas and special things and somebody in the outside claiming you. But at least at that time, that began. And so when you finish medical school or law school or whatever you finish in school, you had to give the government service, obviously. And um, a few months after he graduated from medical school, my father got a call from his wife and they had just, they were newlyweds really. And said, uh, Ramon, I want you to come and talk to, to your nephew because something is terribly wrong and he won't talk to me and he's just not himself. And my father eventually went to see him and said, uh, I believe his name was Juan. Juan, what, what's going on? You just graduated medical school, your life's starting. You now, so you have to put in a couple of years with the army, but then you'll, You'll get out and you'll have, you know, you'll have whatever you, you want to do. And he said, you don't understand, Uncle. You don't, uh, uncle, you don't know what, what my job is. And his job was to 
signed the death certificates of all the political prisoners that were executed at La Cabaña. La Cabaña is, when you look at a, a picture of Havana Harbor and you see the old Spanish fort, the light tower is very similar to the one in, in the entrance to uh, San Juan, Puerto Rico, because the Spanish built the same thing all over the place. Uh, that's La Cabaña. And that's a political prison still today. Um, that's where Che Guevara was in charge. And that's where he made all political prisoners disappear. Um, and if the, the person wasn't dead from the firing squad, my, my father's nephew had to take out his handgun and do the, the coup de grace and, and shoot him in the head. And he said, I, I didn't go to medical school to do this. I, I can't. I can't. And that was, I think, the, the last straw for my father. And he realized that he needed to get out, but he had two problems. First, he was too important in the government. And two, my mom and dad, in the meantime, uh, had been divorced. He had uh, a new wife. Um, and he knew that even if he escaped, <clears throat> the government could use me my sister and my mother as hostages to bring him back. So it became a very difficult situation. Uh, and, and please feel free to stop me because I tend to... No, you're, you're fine. I'm enjoying this quite yeah, a bit. Doc, I need to say, story. I've never been this quiet for this long. So I, the, I agree. The, the world is quiet. saying, my God, he's an <laughs> incredible storyteller. But continue, sir. So one of the things that, that really facilitated the way we left Cuba was the fact that my father's youngest brother uh, was a, a very, very good and talented uh, violin player. He was the first violin for the Havana Symphony Orchestra. And eventually when he left Cuba, he became the first violin for the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. But at that time in the Cuban Symphony Orchestra, there were a lot of Uruguayans and Argentinian uh, Jews who had been socialists in Argentina and Uruguay and because of the right-wing dictatorships in those countries had come to Cuba expecting to enjoy the socialist paradise that Cuba had promised. Now, most of them also have become extremely disenchanted. But what really tipped things over um, was the fact that one of my best friends at age 10 or 11 was an Argentinian kid by the name of Andres Goldberg, and I'll never forget that. And we played together all the time. We lived close by, and his uncle was a violin player for the Symphony Orchestra, same as my, I'm sorry, his father was, and my uncle was, so we knew each other. And he developed brain cancer. And the father, desperate to find him a good neurological center uh, that had open relations with Cuba at that time, took him to Montreal. And in Montreal, he realized that his son was not going to make it and he decided to stay in Montreal and became part of the Montreal Symphony Orchestra and, and talked to them about my uncle and said, look, we need to have this guy here. And little by little, a lot of our friends who were part of the orchestra began to migrate to Canada, including a man by the name of Lazarus Sternick, who was a viola player. And he was a very good friend of ours. And my father finally concocted a plan where in 1966, he began to behave as if he was basically losing his marbles. He began to talk to himself, not shave, much like me. He would go to work thing, in I think that's just a... <laughs> He would show up at the hospital in pajamas or go to a ministerial meeting without a shirt. And a cabal of friends that were close enough said, you know, Ramon really needs this divorce with his previous wife and all this pressure that we put on him. He needs a break. He's not going to find it in Cuba. There's a great psychiatric institute in Montreal. Uh, we have relations. Why don't we send him to Montreal for, for three, three months uh, for treatment? I think he needs it. And that's how he convinced the powers to be, the powers that be, to let him out of Cuba. He knew he couldn't come here to the United States. But he knew that if he left, and we were still in Cuba, his previous family, my mother, me, and my sister, that they could say, well, either you come back or they're going to disappear. Mm. So in the meantime, Mr. Sternick uh, 
married my mother by power of attorney from Montreal oh. and claimed her as his wife and us as her children. And that's how we were able to get a visa in 1967 from uh, Cuba to Spain. Normally the trip was supposed to be Cuba to Spain, Spain to Canada. But of course, in, at Spain we stopped because first we had our grandfather's house there and it wasn't a real marriage. So he came to Spain and they divorced in Spain. Uh, it was a very short lived marriage, but it allowed us to, to get out of Cuba. And my father could now stay in Canada without reprisals to, and eventually he uh, got an internship uh, despite the fact that he was uh, more than qualified uh, in New Brunswick, which is the Maritimes, St. John, New Brunswick, in the Bay of Fundy. Um, and um, within, I believe, three to four months of being an intern, uh, the, the head of the hospital, the head of the medical department, called the, the Royal College and said, look, we have a man here who's teaching all of us anesthesia, and he's an intern please allow him to sit for his boards uh, because we have a teacher here, not a student. So my father became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons uh, almost immediately and began to teach and practice anesthesia. Uh, we now, have come before, to United before States. Before you go on, I don't mean to interrupt you. Once your dad yes. was officially out of Cuba and living in Montreal, were there any right. like uh, attempts to, on his life or you know, did the communists want him back immediately or did any of that type of stuff happen? Yes. Okay. Um, basically a price was put on his head in Cuba. Mm. But my father unfortunately had probably more death threats from exiled Cubans than from the, uh, the uh, country itself. I mean, had he returned to Cuba after saying, no, I don't want to go back. I don't like what's happening in Cuba he probably would have also been put to death by the government and would have disappeared. But the bigger bigger threats came from the fact that a, a lot of people, in, not right away, but in the early 60s, 61, 62, especially after the Bay of Pigs, realized, hey, we're not going back tomorrow like we thought. This is going to be bad. And Ramon is part of the, of the wrong team now. He's, he's now with the government. So he's a traitor to us. You know, he should have come out with us. You know, my father still had the, the hope that, it could, that the Cuban Revolution could work for the Cuban people, that it, the Cuba could become a democratic, fair country for all. Um, so he was never accepted here uh, in the, by the exiles in the United States. So he, he really That's couldn't right. come. Oh, uh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, to that, to that point where you were talking about uh, his hopes for still a de democratic Cuba, right? what are your thoughts on the current situation going on now with the protests there? Yeah, I, I will tell you that I haven't been able to see, a, to get a, a good feel for how many people are on the streets and, and the extent of the demonstrations are. Unfortunately, after so long, um, you, you become a little sanguine because you know how the Cuban government works and uh, these people are putting their lives on the line because many of these people who are on the street will disappear, mm. uh, will have dire consequences to this action. Um, I mean, I, I, I hope it swells. I hope it keeps growing. Um, you know, we've had many times where we thought this has to end. But that brings me to another point is that I... I think after a while, the population that's, that's been beaten down and suppressed and has been isolated from news, like the Cuban people have been, uh, you lose something. Um, and, you know, looking back, probably the biggest mistake Cubans made was, was to leave, okay? In other words, in 19, between 1959 and 1963 or 64, a million out of a country of six million or five some million, so 15 to 18 percent of the population left Cuba. Mm. And, and who left Cuba? Well, the doctors, the lawyers, the intelligentsia, right? The people with, with means 
and then everybody else that could get out because things became very difficult. So even if you were a carpenter and wanted to get out, now you couldn't because you didn't have the means or the connections. But what we did was is we created a vacuum that was filled by these uneducated revolutionaries because you take somebody who, who's lacking in education, who feels that they have been wrong somewhat for whatever reason, and you give them power, they can become a very, very dangerous person mm. because now they want to show off that power. And, and that's really what happened to Cuba. We took the people who were more likely to fight both on an intellectual and a military level out of the country. And then you take a country that is an island so you can shut it down completely, 100%. You can meddle with uh, communications and news. So you have a country that's truly isolated. They'll believe what you tell them. Until 1967, the year that I left, we lived in fear that the United States was going to invade tomorrow. I mean, it wasn't going to happen next year. No. It was tomorrow. And when you drove around Havana and you looked at the high rises, there were anti aircraft guns everywhere. Everybody had to belong to the militia. Everybody, if you were in school, had to be a pioneer. Okay, you were part of the machine that was being indoctrinated to fight. Just think that at the shortly after the Bay of Pigs, in a country of six million people, Cuba had a standing army of two point three million people. That's that's incredible. That's crazy. People were starving, but they were buying MIGs and tanks and rifles. They were never going to stop an invasion from the from the United States. It would be like a flea. The United States would just flick them off. That was to keep the people in place. Yeah. People can't have guns in Cuba. Uh, so, you know, I, I've gone through a, a great personal journey. Um, after looking at my father's life, after looking at what happened in Cuba, and after seeing the change in the immigration pattern, the, the, the quality of the person that's coming out of Cuba now, as opposed to the quality of the people that came in the early years. The people that came in the early years came because they were dissatisfied with the government. They thought, we're going to leave. This is not going to last. Cuba is not a place where communism can flourish. We are Democrats at heart. We're coming back in a few months. This soon will be over. Um, and in the meantime, until we were there, we're going to work hard and we're going to be successful here. And uh, as I was telling uh, a friend before, at least until, and I, and I don't know with the latest uh, immigration waves that the United States has, has experienced, but the Cuban immigration to, the, to this country, at least until the 1990s, was considered the most um, successful immigration wave ever in our history. In other words, the Cubans came, they worked hard, they developed capital, mm -hmm. developed uh, industry. Uh, again, Miami is a city built by Cubans, and it's a, it's a great metropolis. Mm -hmm. So they came to work hard to create a legacy, and eventually they realized they probably are not going to go back. So they became truly part of the American fabric. And they were willing to do whatever it takes. Uh, uh, I've seen the, uh, the interview that you did with Fred Valdez, and so he was very right. I was going to mention that he mentioned yep. the same thing as you're talking about. It's, it was interesting, <laughs> too, it's Doctor, because Fred Valdez kind of had a very different childhood than yours. I, yeah. I, his family was more, right. I believe, like, a, you know, not, his dad wasn't involved with Castro, the revolutionary, or anything like that. Right. And you both kind of like that turned out to be two very successful doctors, two very, you know, successful um, authors. And I do know, I, I will say that, uh, have you been on Miami Vice? Sure. No, Dr. Not like, Dr. Not Fred like has been on a couple episodes <laughs> of Miami Vice, Doctor. But we are actually I, I, unfortunately I've, I've coming the to the shows. end of our hour. Uh, Doc, I want to thank you so much for telling this story. It is an incredible story. And again, as everyone who is watching knows, I am never this quiet for this no, long. He, he's not. So you had an incredible uh, story. And I can't thank you enough for coming on our little program here and telling it. Um, it's been a pleasure. It, it's been amazing. Thank you, Doctor.
It's been a pleasure. And what I meant is that I've been into Miami Vice, not in Miami Vice like Fred. He's, but, a, he's a real star. One more thing. <laughs> Have you been back to Cuba or, since you've left it? And would you like to? Or You know, um, I couldn't for a long time because I know my father had a warrant out. And my name uh, is exactly the same as my father, except for the middle name. And I, and I knew how much the government knew about my movements because every time I came to the United States, the people at Customs knew every address that my father had lived in Canada for the last 15 years. They knew exactly where my father was. I figured if the, if the United States government knows that, the Cuban government knows that too. Mm -hmm. So I figured if I went to Cuba, I may never get out while he was alive. And after, after he, he passed because of our name, I, I thought it would be too dangerous to go. I think now it's probably okay, um, but I, I really, knowing who owns tourism and all the dollars that come in with tourism in Cuba, which are the military generals, I really don't want to support them in any way. Um, mm. So until Cuba becomes a little more democratic, I don't think I'll be visiting anytime soon. And Doctor, I know we need to wrap this up a little bit, but there, you had something important to share. Um, we talked offline a little bit about, you said the immigrants that came, or the wave that came in the 90s, is different from the wave that's coming now. Can you go into a little yes. more detail on that? Yes, I, I, you know, I, I think eventually, when people have no opportunity and no, uh, no hope for opportunity, they lose the drive to succeed in life. And again, talking to all, uh, and I came to an area of New Jersey where there was a very large Cuban population. So my medical practice uh, starting in the, in the 80s uh, was almost all Cuban initially. And all these people had a, a single denominator. They came and they worked their fingers to the bone whether you have been a count, and we actually have a friend who was a count from Spain living in Havana and was, you know, cleaning floors in, in a factory to a dishwasher, you worked hard to succeed. In the last, I'm going to say the last 10 years, uh, the type of Cuban that was able to get out, that came to see me in the office, was totally different. I would ask him, so what, why'd you come? What do you, what do you want to do? What, what's your... Well, I heard that here you can get welfare and you can get, uh, you know, subsidies for living and you can get food stamps. That was not the immigration wave that I lived with, that I saw for many years. This was somebody who, who had lost all desire to, to better themselves. If we would have said, if they would have said to me, look, I'm, we're here because we're going to go to school, we want to learn English, we want to get a trade, we want to, you know, renew our law license or whatever. No, these people are broken. They, they know that trying hard doesn't mean success. They, they lost that. Mm -hmm. We still have that as Americans. If you work hard, if you put in what it takes, you can be anything you want. They don't think they can be anything. They've mm -hmm. lost that drive. And to me, it's a lost generation. And that's a shame because mm -hmm. Cuba has the, 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 the geography, the wealth, the mineral wealth and, and the natural wealth and the beauty to be what the Spaniards always called it, which was the peril of the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a different generation, and I think we have to get it back. And we can only get it back by going back to Cuba, creating a democratic government and creating opportunities in Cuba for the people who live there so they remember what it's like to get educated and get trained and have a business and have a career and be successful. Yeah, thank you for sharing Excellent. that. Yes. Well, Doctor, that brings us to the end of our hour. I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your incredible story. For all those who are watching, yeah, once again, we had author and Dr. Ray Ladon. His book, A Cold July in Cuba, Recollections of My Father the Revolutionary, can be purchased on Amazon. You can follow us on all of the social media platforms, YouTube, Facebook, Rumble, uh, Twitter, etc., we hope to see you for our next part on Cuba, and we will also be finishing up our Afghan series. Joy, you want to take us out? If you missed any of this uh, podcast or our first one in, on Cuba, you can go to uh, Rumble or YouTube. Uh, we would appreciate you uh, subscribing and commenting. And you can also visit our website at www.ascf.us. Until next time, please join us again as we bring you the stories on protecting our freedoms. Thanks a lot, Doctor.
Looking forward to being back. Excellent. With you. Talk to you Take soon. Care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.